There we go. <laughs> hey, everybody. Now, I want to make sure that everything is fine. You guys let me know when... Let me see. Uh, right there. There. You guys let me know if you can hear me and all that good stuff before we start. <laughs> hey. Hello. Nice to see everybody. Howdy, taste. Hey. Now, for those in chat that I haven't seen part one, go watch part one and then come back and watch the replay of this. Because, obviously, it tells a complete story. You don't want to be halfway through the story. That's like uh, Goldilocks and the Three Bears. And you, you come into the story, it's like, this porch sucks. And what happened? <laughs> you don't know what's going on. You can hear, I can hear you well. There's no, uh, there's... There should be uh, no uh, echoing and all that stuff, right? Now, if I can put the mic. See, it's my mic here. Let me see. See, I put my mic here. See, let me get really close. Hey, guys. Thanks for watching. Thanks for coming out and hanging with me. So grab yourself some popcorn and something to drink, and we'll have a nice little good time for a couple hours. Yeah. SMR. ASMR with taste. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, yeah, good. I'm glad you watched part one. Can I be in the video? You just are, Sean. You just are. <coughs> so, everything should be fine. Let's go. Chapter two starts, or uh, part two starts with chapter 11. I'm guessing it's going to be a lot of five shows at Wario's and Emma. <laughs> And all that stuff. So, uh, I put my mic a little closer. I watched a little bit of the first chapter up on my channel, and I seemed low. The actual voice of the of the game is fine, but my voice is a little bit low. So, I brought my mic just a tad bit closer. Not too much closer, but... Anyways. <coughs> Let's go. Here we go. This is going to be fun. Uh... Gray City. Yeah, this is going to be five shows of Wario stuff. <laughs> Bruno woke up. Yes, I remember, Jordan. He did not know what was happening, where he was, even if he was alive or dead. Who was he again? The confusion in his soul had gotten the best of him. All he knew was that he was lying in a street in the middle of a huge 1930s-like style city. Neon and red lights in windows. Light rain was hitting his forehead. The sound of traffic in the distance. Where was he? Right in front of him was a massive, colorful theater. Maybe someone inside could help him out, he thought. And so he went inside. He entered the massive main theater hall. Completely empty, with no people around. Suddenly, a voice on the speakers started talking, as if a show was about to begin for Bruno alone. Welcome, welcome. The theater is proud to present tonight's shows. If this is your first time visiting, we hope the experience will be one to remember. The voice was inviting, excited, and talked about how Bruno would be participating in this interactive theater experience. This is such a great Bruno just wanted to ask for help, help, but no one was there to hear him out. In the middle of the speech of the announcer, awesome, Bruno blacked out. Feeling like he was pulled into a dark void for a brief moment. In here, he heard a distorted Thanks, electrical SML. voice speaking to him. I don't know how you will see this message. I'm not sure, Jordan. We'll find out. But you have to remember what's going on. I haven't seen this, Jordan. You are Bruno. Thanks, Captain Obvious. I knew that. I'll get to it, Patrickus. You are not in a theater, it's all a trick. Don't believe 
believe Before Bruno could process it all, and even ask who it was who was talking to him, he was thrown back into the theater hall. The show was apparently about to begin. It's in our choices that results emerge. I believe we are ready. Let the shows begin! But this was no ordinary theater show. Behind the curtains, strangely enough, were five tunnels, each leading to a different experience so, that Bruno had to survive. I the crap out of this game. It was here he realized he was part of some game or prank or trap, perhaps. And if he wanted to leave unharmed, he had to just play along. And as he participated in these surreal tasks, familiar faces slowly creeped out from the darkness. Twisted, deformed versions of Wario and the rest were attacking him, torturing him and messing with him. These abominations were what is known as the virus. The virus is... The virus is really just another name for the curse. These entities were already, therefore the curse itself, Patricus. manifested as sentient individual beings, taking the forms of the people it had possessed previously. Now how did this happen? Creating an individualization of the curse, being these virus characters required the curse itself to be powerful. How did it happen? And until now, it hadn't been powerful enough to go through with this process. But now, through many years of possession, the curse was not only powerful enough to drag Bruno Gate's soul down to this realm, but also to create individual pieces of itself, resembling the people it once possessed. <laughs> so who created them? Did this energy on its own decide to take a part of itself and make it a sentient being? Not quite, but not far from it either. Remember back in Wario's fast food factory when Richard believed he saw a face floating in a hallway? Mm -hmm. it's Emma. This was no illusion. This was the dark energy formation released alongside the others when the curse got released from the book. This is the hive mind of the virus itself. The source of the curse and the sentient container for this dark energy. This is Emma. And she has been here ever since this chaos got released. Hi, Emma. She let her powers slowly grow as it possessed the others. Letting them play their game of cat and mouse while she was watching from the shadows as the master plan was unfolding. As the timeline cycle happened over and over again, her powers grew more and more powerful until it was strong enough to drag Bruno Gates' soul down to this realm, where she originates from. This realm, this strange city with obscure dark elements and screams echoing throughout the streets, is known as Grey City, the realm below creation. The world where Emma and her powers were created. Richard McCroy's nightmares about TV channels were not merely random thoughts manifesting in his dreams. As Richard was being possessed at the time, these nightmares were in fact a glimpse into the realm of Grey City. The TV channels named Cooking with Emma was in fact a direct insight into one of these theater shows that Bruno had to go through. And the tall, abnormal warrior figure appearing in Richard's dreams, the one known as Nightmare Wario or Demon Wario, this was none other than Emma herself, taking on one of her two forms. So the question remains, is all of this was a plot for Emma to drag Bruno Gate down to Grace City? What did she plan to do with him here? Torture his soul? Play with him? Toy with him? Bruno slowly but surely completed the show trial set before him, shocked by the sheer confusion and terror he was experiencing. 
But by the end, a deep, soothing voice talked to him, apologizing for dragging him into the theater, and told him that he was free to leave and to look for a trapdoor in the back of the theater. Bruno immediately ran back to try and find the exit, and came across a small hut outside on a backside. Inside was, indeed, a trapdoor, as well as a tape recorder that somebody had left behind. Playing the tape revealed the voice of an Irish man who claimed to be trapped underneath, and that the trapdoor did not lead to any tunnel or cavern or cellar, but instead an entire house, strangely enough. I'm trapped down here, but I still have hope. Hope that I will find my way out of here, and hopefully this recording reaches anyone who suffers a similar fate as I currently do. Here, underground, there is a structure. A building. Bruno took the chance, confused, and jumped down the trapdoor, only to land in an attic of an old house. Logically, it was impossible, and he had no idea what was going on. But he quickly realized that this too was a trap, a mistake. The curse, the virus, was approaching the house he found himself in. Looking out the window, the house was seemingly in the middle of nowhere. Using instructions from the man on the tape recorder, Bruno did what he could to keep the entities out, blocking off any entrance or other mysterious access points they had. Terrified, he managed to open more and more doors in the house, allowing him to explore and thus encounter more twisted faces of people the curse once possessed. Running out and away was not an option, as the landscape seemed to stretch endlessly, and one of the virus formations was roaming around in a small forest nearby. So instead, he aimed for the basement of the house. Down in the basement, he found a statue of Emma's demon warrior form, as well as a long handwritten letter. A letter from the same man who had recorded the voice message earlier. A message, Thomas Taylor. The letter explains his journey after the incident at WarioWare Incorporated where he went over to Wario's factory and discovered the closed-off cellar, and how he somehow got transported through the use of high electrical power. Now it was confirmed. When Thomas Taylor disappeared, he bridged the gap and found himself in Grey City, where he was transported by a mysterious man to this very theater, where he was then in the presence of something sinister. Something more sinister and evil than Emma. This mysterious entity asked Thomas how he found this place, before sending him here to this house. This is how Emma, through this mysterious entity, learned that Wario's factory was indeed a point where the two worlds were close to each other and acted as a perfect place to drag Bruno through. And seeing as Bruno was wandering confused around the factory at the time, it fit perfectly with Emma's plan. Creepy. That is why she transported Edward and the rest to Wario's factory. Bruno, stuck in the factory, was the one who could break the curse on the spirits of Wario and the rest, and Wario's factory was the bridge between the two worlds. It all worked perfectly into the master plan. But where was Thomas Taylor now? Was he still here? There was no trace of him left, aside from this letter. Bruno obviously did not know who Thomas Taylor was, so he kept on hiding until he hits a dead end in the house, where the viruses attacked him at full force. Completely exhausted and drained, Bruno saw the viruses retreat. Was it over? That's when the theater voice returned, 
announcing the show trials were over. And as it turned out, this voice was none other than Emma, who had been talking to Bruno all along. And Emma goes on to explain more of the plan that was unfolding before Bruno's eyes. She explains how the curse had to grow strong before it could drag Bruno down here to Grey City, how the virus entities can be created in shapes of people it had possessed, and how the plan for Bruno was to weaken his soul through spiritual torture. By weakening Bruno's soul, it could more easily be manipulated and used by Emma. Due to the strength of a human soul, a soul that doesn't belong in a place like this, it could now be used as a bridge between Grey City and the real world. Emma can bring all of her powers now into the real world, including her newly created virus entities. All thanks to Bruno's strong soul that was now weakened due to the spiritual torture he had now endured. But why? Why? For what purpose? Why did Emma want to bring all of her powers into the real world? Just to create chaos? Or was there a more direct purpose to it? Ooh, yeah, why? The reason was to free him. In order to finally free her master. Who's the master? Chapter 12. Free the master. The master plan. Okay, now we get to see this whole thing. What a story. Holy crap. If Wario doesn't pick up that book... Bruno Gates was slowly realizing what was going on. Everything that had happened had happened the way Emma wanted to. It was all part of her plan to weaken his soul and thus use it as a link between the world above to release her curse fully onto the world. Only a human soul can release Emma and her powers into the world, which explains why Wario could release a small portion of it from the ancient book, and why Emma could now travel with all her powers, using Bruno's soul as a sort of a tunnel or a gateway. And with a large, rumbling noise, and what felt like a shock going through him. Emma and the viruses were gone. They had escaped. A deep silence filled the dark void for a long time. Until that unknown soothing voice returned once more. Hey guys, it's taste. It's the voice told Bruno how his part was complete and that the curse was now fully out in the world, ready to take it back. Is, that's when is As that the voice right? talked, a gigantic silhouette yeah. was slowly appearing in the darkness. Oh While we wait, why not play another game? The voice asked. Bruno was frozen and did not respond. That's when the shape in the darkness showed itself fully. The most terrifying sight Bruno had ever witnessed. This was him. This is the one Emma referred to as her master. This was Emma's creator. The devil himself. Who created him? The original evil and the highest being of Grey City and the very origin of the curse itself. This devil was only known as Entity 01. Emma was his powers, or rather a fraction of his powers. Emma was the manifestation of his powers that was now able to escape into the real world through a single human soul. 
Now, Bruno's purpose in this master plan was complete. So what exactly was Entity One's master plan? What was his end game? His goal? What is the reason behind all of these events unfolding? Was it simply to put fear and despair into people's hearts? Was it to kill everyone on Earth? Or did he have some deeper desire? Entity 01 did have a goal. The ultimate goal. Just as Grey City was the realm below creation, so also did a realm above creation exist. A heavenly paradise, as this devil describes it. Filled with flowers and gardens with no end. He believed this heavenly place was the place of origin. The place where everything, including himself, was created. Getting back to this place where he came into existence to learn the truth of why he's trapped down in this underworld and learn the truth of what he really is. And that was the ultimate goal of Entity 01. And how could he reach this place? That's where his plan comes in. As he himself had way too much power to exit the dimension of Grey City, and as even the full extent of his powers were too much to slip through into the real world, he managed to send just one tiny, tiny fraction of his powers a long time ago. This was the form of a book that held a small amount of his curse inside it. Emma, in her earliest stages. It was everything he was able to send through into the real world above. There were even religious cults from back in the day that worshipped the mythical devilish one through the discovery of this book that promised wealth and power to those who followed its instructions. As people, and especially an ancient witch coven that had found deep interest in the mythology of Entity 01, went through with rituals, the curse residing within the book slowly grew stronger. In modern times, it was strong enough to finally escape the book, should someone manage to release it. Wario released it, and her powers cursed them all and started to grow even further, like a leech draining their energies. However, this was still only a small part of Entity 01's powers. In the end, Emma would only be strong enough to bring down one human soul. And if it was going to use this soul later to escape back into the world, the soul had to be a strong one. Hence why Bruno Gates became this unfortunate victim. Now, Emma, which is a manifestation of a part of Entity 01's powers, had escaped back into the world through Bruno's tormented soul, and was now free in the world with much more of Entity 01's powers with her. The curse could finally start to spread like a wildfire, growing stronger and stronger until, eventually, far off in a distant future, it would be strong enough to bring Entity 01 himself up into the real world. Oh, that would be bad. And once there, all he would have to do would be to find the access point. The point with the thinnest layer between the world and the heavenly dimension above. Now, all he had to do, and all he could do, was wait. Wait for the viruses in the world to start infecting the world. But it would not take long for time in Grey City was flowing at a different rate than the real world. As for this final game, Entity 01 put Bruno Gates through another trial. Not solely for the sake of torture, however, but as a test. A test to see just how strong his soul truly is. Should his plan somewhere along the way go wrong, he had a backup plan, a plan B. And if Bruno's spirit could survive this upcoming trial, then Bruno would play a big part in this backup plan. 
Bruno was suddenly transported out of this nothingness and into a new building in this strange city. But something was familiar. Too familiar for his own liking. Bruno was back in Wario's fast food factory. A recreation of it. An illusion of it. And in this illusion was also the illusion of the very same people he killed. Bruno was unaware that this was all a trick, a hallucination if you will, and instantly got flashbacks to his crimes in the factory and immediately went into defense mode. Impressively, Bruno used any means he could to defend himself throughout this false factory, and in the end managed to outplay the illusion and escape it. Entity 01 was impressed. His test was complete and Bruno passed. There was clearly a deep motivational power in his spirit. What was it exactly that kept Bruno going so strongly? As a final act before the long wait began, Entity 01 presented Bruno with a machine. A memory arcade meant as a final kick in the face to the broken man. Bruno was forced to watch the screen, and what he saw broke him even more. Here, Bruno had to relive the last meeting with Dolores Gates, his wife. Thank you. 
that's why he broke into the factory to get the recipe, all that stuff. He was trying to get something to make money to pay for an operation for his daughter. And he ends up killing the killing Wario and then Bruno's the core motivation that he dies. had always been his daughter. Oh, to make her healthy once more. It was the reason he broke into Wario's factory to steal the recipe. Yep. It was the reason he was desperate to get out alive and unnoticed. Even if it would mean the cost the lives of others. Wow. And it was one of the reasons his soul could not rest even after death. As he was walking aimlessly around the factory in his dead physical body during the events of the cycle, the one sound that instantly awoke something deep within him and drew his attention to it was the sound of the music box that Edward Coleman had brought with him. It was the very same music box his daughter had, and hearing it immediately drove him in its direction. His daughter was in the very core of his being. This is why the music box was able to attract Bruno Gates. Bruno, now sitting in this nothingness and watching his last meeting with his wife, knowing he failed his promise to both her and his daughter, was left with the worst, horrific and hopeless feeling of all. And now, he was all alone. So, wife left him, daughter's sick, he tried to help, now he's dead, now he's cursed, walking around, Emma's using him, Entity 01 used Emma to use him to get, eventually, Entity into the world to get up top to where he believes everything's created. Oh, heavy. During the events happening down in Grey City, Edward Coleman had left Wario's fast food factory early in the morning. Heavy rain hit his head as he was concerned about Max Peterson, the man who had called him each night to see if he was okay. Edward eventually reached Secure Incorporated, the place where Max Peterson worked. Inside, he saw Max lying face down on his desk, he was dead. with a stab wound in his back. He was gone, killed by Richard McRoy earlier the same night. Here, Edward found three diary entries, written by Max. The first diary talked about James, someone apparently Max knew about. Max writes that James just vanished, disappeared, while working at Wario's fast food factory in 2014. He writes how James' body was never found, so he was sure that James was alive somewhere. The second diary talks about his cousin, Christopher, and how he too disappeared, in a similar manner. The diary talks about how Christopher was using the WarioWare building for research after it burned down in 1993. It further talks about rumors that were going around at the time. Rumors that the very secret company he and Lucas McRoy were working for had discovered an ancient DNA of a dragon-like creature. Max speculates here, in this entry, about the connection between this DNA rumor and WarioWare burning down, and the potential connection between the two. Was Bowser this rumored ancient creature? And did Christopher's company resurrect it? Did this company have a hand in WarioWare burning down? Did they command the creature to burn it to the ground? If so, why? The third entry was the news entry, and here Max had written about Edward Coleman and how someone must have tricked him into the job here at Secure Incorporated. Max then goes on to talk about Christopher again and the last phone call the two of them had before Christopher disappeared. In this final phone call, Christopher had talked about his research, as well as hearing his own voice echoing throughout the hallways. This voice was hard to make out, but Christopher had claimed the voice was saying Emma. 
this was the final entry Edward found. He went on to look around the building of Secure Incorporated. No one else was around except the body of Max Peterson. As Edward was walking through one of the hallways, an unknown voice screeched through the air, as if it was tearing itself through the walls. The voice said, Mr. Coleman, are you there? It's not over. They're not gone. Get out of there. Get out. I don't know why, but... It was the voice of Christopher, warning Edward Coleman about something before the voice got cut off. What was happening? What was with all these voices of Christopher echoing through the halls everywhere? First the voice talking to himself in WarioWare and mentioning the name of Emma and now it was back talking to Edward. Later we may just learn what's going on with Christopher in this case. But maybe you've started to make some connections. The Christopher of this timeline had vanished many years ago, back in WarioWare. So was this him? Or could this be the one from the first original timeline? The one who used his own time machine on himself. And his warning was no joke. Edward heard a rumbling sound from within the building. He still had his pad with him and managed to connect it to the building's camera system, as they were the same types used in McCroy House. There, he saw something that made his blood run cold. Wario was back, only in a shape that was straight out of a nightmare. This was Virus Wario. Emma and her newly created viruses had just escaped into the world through Bruno Gate. And judging by Christopher's voice suddenly being cut off, it is possible that he became the first victim of this up-and-coming apocalypse, and Edward seemed to be the next one. Edward tried to escape while keeping track of Virus Wario on his camera pad. Eventually he reached the exit door, only to be met by Virus Wario who killed Edward Coleman on the spot. Two dead bodies were no present Insecure Incorporated, killed by the same core monster. The world would never be the same. The viruses, the curse, kept a low profile in the beginning, and people felt something strange in the air. Things were not right, and it didn't take long before people started to notice that things were wrong as people slowly, one by one, were reported missing, never to be seen again. One of these unfortunate victims was a man we know from before, Winslow. There was news aimed directly towards Winslow that the old Wario's Cafe was opening once again in early 2018, 30 years after the original opening. And since Winslow had experience from this place, they wanted him back as an employee. Winslow was the very same person who had been calling Wario on the phone during his night shifts back in the late 80s. And as Winslow heard they were reopening the old cafe once more, a strong sense of nostalgia came brushing over him like a summer breeze. He accepted the offer immediately. The strange thing was that no one else had heard about this, and Winslow himself didn't know who these new owners were. He was called by one of the employers, who didn't even introduce himself, and Winslow was told that they wanted to bring joy to people by bringing back the old Wario's experience from back in the day. Hey, look it up! I found your number! Alright, now, listen up. I really do appreciate you taking time out of your day to do this, but dude, this will turn out amazing! Winslow's first task was to come to the cafe and check on the place, the equipment available, etc. And so he did. Cameras were still functioning somewhat, lamps and electrical components were in order, and while browsing through the old camera system, Virus Wario could be seen on the attic camera for a brief second, before the monitor itself cracked.
Winslow flinched and froze in place. Flashbacks from the original diner's events came back to him as if a nightmare from before had now become a reality. Everything was silent. Slowly but surely, Winslow headed towards the exit. On his way through the cafe, he felt dizzy and a strong red color filled his vision before blacking out. Who are you running from? <laughs> Creepy. You have visited never no 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 claim your prize now. Click here. To be Christopher and Rosalina he woke up again in the cafe the following night, Has to be. and he couldn't leave. Exits were blocked off, there was no signal to call for help outside. He was all alone. That is when it came to human interaction, because with him in the cafe were the virus entities, hunting him down and tormenting him as poor Winslow tried to grasp the situation. Did an unknown company truly reopen Wario's cafe? Or was this all a trick? Where they lured Winslow into a false sense of safety and nostalgia in order to trap him? It was the man who had called Winslow earlier the voice of these creatures? Oh. Or was it an actual employee of a company? Brush those teeth. This question would remain unanswered forever. And we will never know for sure if an actual company decided to reopen Warriors Cafe, or if this was all a trick by Emma's viruses. Winslow was trapped in a cafe for many days, slowly losing energy due to hunger and lack of water, as well as the viruses toying with his fear to the extreme. All currently created viruses acted slightly differently. The one resembling Luigi would put Winslow in an existential crisis by making him question his reality with computer ads and other forms of world-bending shenanigans. The one resembling Mario would reach out of a mirror with unusual body proportions, only to retract into a decoy shell once he escaped. They all tortured Winslow psychologically, until finally, when he couldn't bear it anymore, they killed him, and so the curse kept growing, stronger and stronger, over several years, picking up momentum as it went on. Eventually, it started to spread like a plague. A bunch of freaks. There was nothing humanity could do. It's like zombies. Entity 01's plan was working. The virus entities and the rest of Emma's powers were wrecking havoc across the globe. Chapter 14 The house with the green door. Green door? The house with the green door? What house is that? The year is 2745. What? In a hidden laboratory. The last man on earth sits quietly on his own. Christopher was waiting in anticipation. Here in the distant future where every man, woman and child were gone, the virus had destroyed them all. This was the Christopher who originated from the original first timeline, back in the very beginning of our story. Back when a curse got unleashed for the very first time. Christopher made a deal with Rosalina. That she would send their souls back in time to hopefully reset everything. And Christopher would use himself as an experiment. Where he ended up was here in 2745. In one of the laboratories belonging to the company that remained untouched. Just like Christopher had feared, the events back in the factory simply continued on in a new timeline and led to every sinister event that followed, resulting in this wasteland. 
During his time here, he had found lots of intel. Diaries, news articles, voice recordings, all information that helped him to understand how the current situation had ended up in its current state. As Christopher's understanding of time evolved, he finally cracked the code and figured out what had happened. The two timelines, due to the long passing of time, had merged back into one, combining. This meant that this was the ultimate outcome. The virus had grown strong and was roaming the earth looking for any survivors remaining. As Christopher continued his dedicated research, all alone in this strange future, his machine were able to eventually detect a dark energy stronger than any other. It seemed to be a sort of a hive mind, the brain behind the cursed entities roaming outside. Although he couldn't see this dark source, he could detect it. And he called it Emma. It became Christopher's theory that Emma had plans to eradicate all life on Earth, or even some other plan to keep growing stronger on her own. He feared she was watching him, knew about him, and he feared that if she found out he knew about her, that he was trying to stop her plan, she would kill him. If this was the case, he had to get help. If this knowledge died with him, there was no one left to save them. That's when he decided to spend an enormous amount of power to activate his time machine. It lit up in a purple light, sparkled with electricity, and once the flares had died out, James was standing inside a machine, confused, scared, terrified. This is where James ended up and he disappeared. In a second timeline, when he was talking to Richard McRoy on the phone while they worked at Wario's fast food factory, James vanished into thin air. Max Peterson wrote this in his diary, that he couldn't believe James was dead. He believed he was still out there, somewhere. And he was correct. James vanishing was in fact Christopher teleporting him into the distant future where the timelines had merged and all hell was loose. James tried to ask what was going on, but Christopher was silent. He spoke very little, and when he did, his voice was whispering, as if he was afraid someone was listening. He told James where they were. A lab called the House with a Green Door. He told James further about the discoveries about the past. How his machine made the flow of time split into two branches, and that this James came from the second branch, the second timeline. Otherwise, Christopher didn't say much. James just observed things he did. One of them was talking into a sort of microphone connected to the time machine. He seemed to be talking to himself as he was warning Christopher about an entity named Emma. This was indeed the voice Christopher had heard while working in the old WarioWare facility. He claimed to hear his own voice echoing through the halls, and as James now witnessed, that voice came from himself from the distant future, where he tried to send a warning about an entity named Emma. It was beyond the understanding of James. Who was Emma? Not long after, James witnessed Christopher trying to send yet another voice message back in time, this time to none other than Edward Coleman. Christopher, through his archives, knew that this curse would eventually take over the world, and so he tried to warn Edward Coleman, explaining the voice Edward heard in Secure Incorporated. And just as he was talking, James saw it. For a brief second, a face, blurred in motion, swooped in, and just like that, Christopher was gone. James stood there in shock. Was this the Emma entity he had mentioned earlier? Emma took Christopher. Terrified and alone, James started to go through Christopher's archives. And among tons of information about the past, he also found audio logs Christopher had left behind. No rat 
imagine that was Winston. My never-ending dedication to the time travel project paid off in the end. It appears the fabric of space and time isn't exactly the way we foresaw it. This has given me a new insight into how our worlds are all connected. But this future confirms the deepest fear I had in my heart. Yeah, Whatever sure. happened back then simply continued on in a new timeline. The world is now a wasteland. My research has to continue in a hope that I one day may return to my dearest wife, Rosalina. According to my data, my wife kept her promise and did what I asked her to do before I left. And my hypothesis was right. The life energy of a human, or a human soul, can indeed be extracted from the physical body by my machine. Unfortunately, it appears to have made things worse. Archived phone recordings lead me to believe this curse eventually got lifted. But something must have gone wrong along the way. It's still unclear to me what this entity is, and even how much she's able to observe. But thanks to my newly developed tracker machine of undetectable matter, her existence is almost as good as confirmed. I have named it Emma. Whether or not she is connected to the collapse of Mr. McRoy and the events that followed is still unclear. Whatever she is, she may be the key to what this is all about. What do I do from here? I'm afraid the empty earth has taken a toll on me. Maybe the unseen one is the one to blame for this. Where I'm just a piece in a game of chess. I fear my time is running low. Someone must take my spot. Dear James, when you hear this message, I may be gone. It's dangerous to speak in this way. I fear Emma is listening. I fear she knows what I know. I fear she knows about my knowledge of her existence. But there's no time to waste. You have probably gotten some ideas of what is going on from calling Richard every night in Wario's fast food factory. I've brought you here to help me stop whatever is happening. The technology here is exactly what it says on the tin. Use it to send a message back to yourself. She might hear this message, but that's a risk I simply have to take. You have more time than I do. Encrypt a message and return it to the past. A message she cannot decipher. A message. Wow, this is trippy. Through the audio logs and other logs Christopher left behind, James now understood. He understood a lot more about how these events were all connected. He understood more what Emma possibly was. The source of evil that had been tormenting Richard back in the factory, which evolved into the evil now roaming around outside. Christopher had told him to send a cryptic message back through his machine. Back to himself from the first timeline where this all started. A message telling himself about all of this. What would happen if the curse got unleashed? And how he had to prevent the Wario from ever unleashing it. But how could he do this? How could he make a message that Emma could not decrypt? He certainly remembered his hobby in game development. A video game series. A perfect way to encrypt the message. James began immediately to develop simple, short video games that tried to replicate some of the major events he had read about. And in these simple games he hid messages that he knew he, himself, would understand. These games were short, poorly drawn and had a hint of humor, all to try to draw Emma's attention away from what he was doing. The timelines can feel confusing. Are multiple Christopher versions the same person? Is it a soul split in two? Is time in Grey City also split in two? Etc. 
there's a lot of details to wrap one's head around. And yes, a soul is split in two when the timeline splits in two. But time only split in the normal dimension, the main world, the created world. Grey City and the mythical rumored world above creation are both not affected by this and are running in their own time and speed but all of them are running in a linear time. Time is always running in one direction. Eventually, through the natural flow of time, these two split timelines would merge back together. This James came from the second timeline where most of our story up until now has taken place. The Christopher from the first and original timeline was the one James had just met, and the one that Emma had recently taken away. The Christopher from the second timeline, on the other hand, disappeared while doing research in WarioWare Incorporated, as you may remember. But was this also Emma's doing? Was it Emma that also took Christopher from Timeline 2 away? Or was it something else going on at that point? Dedication, dedication. Reset. There's two Christophers, two James. Christopher from the first James time. had finished playtesting his games. During his playtesting, however, a strange face he hadn't coded kept appearing in the games. He had a deep fear that this was Emma, who showed herself in his games to toy with him. Letting him know that she knew what he was doing. I know what you're doing. The games were now ready to be sent as code files back through Christopher's time machine. He walked quickly through Christopher's lab and eventually found his machine again. On his way through the corridors, he came across more diary entries from Christopher. One ripped out page described how he had a strange feeling towards a nearby lake. A lake named Lake Emma. Christopher had felt something strange associated with this area and his radars and equipment that had helped track down Emma in the first place were also having strange reactions towards this lake. In another entry that Christopher had written, an entry hidden away, he explains that he hadn't thought much of it before, but one day he decided to sneak out of his lab to investigate the lake. 
He reached the lake safely, and nothing seemed to be out of the ordinary, except for one star in the night sky that was shining more brightly than the others. This entry was directed towards James personally. Christopher continued to write that James should not continue reading the letter. Because what Christopher learned during his trip to the lake could just be too much for James to comprehend. Canonically, James decided to not read on and leave Christopher's discovery to the imagination. Instead, he heads for the time machine to send the coded games back in time. As he approached the machine, however, a gust of warm wind blew across the room, and Emma appeared as if out of nowhere. James did not hesitate. He grabbed the first tools he could find in the lab. The first tools that could deal damage to someone. And it was a tool that could electroshock someone. To his surprise, as Emma tried to snatch him away, the electroshock equipment seemed to stun her, hurt her. A high-pitched screech emitted from the floating head. Was electricity the counterweapon against the curse? This seemed to be the first true proof of just that. James continued to attack, and so did Emma. In the midst of the intense adrenaline rush, James was thinking about the tools he used, and if Christopher had left them here for this specific reason. Did he have a theory that electricity could defeat Emma? Emma got weaker and weaker, her face almost melting away, before she eventually exploded in a dark burst of energy. Everything went quiet. Not just inside the lab, but outside as well. The curse in the world was gone. And out of the darkness, Christopher emerged. He was alive, to James's surprise. Yo, what's up? It's me. They reunited and had a conversation about the events that had just happened. Christopher explained that the curse got out in a much bigger quantity and quality due to the manipulation of Bruno Gates' soul back in 2017, and that Emma and her curse was now gone forever. They finally had a conversation about death. James was afraid what would happen to him if the timelines reset back to one again. Would he be the same? Would he be gone? Who is he, really? Christopher reassured him that death is not to be feared, and that life without little risk and mystery is no life at all. As for changing the past, why didn't Christopher do this before? Because he didn't know exactly how time worked until now, and once Emma was onto him, it was too late. Until James came along to finish his work. In the end, James went over to the machine to finally send the games back in time to himself in the past. Standing alone, Christopher's face went from happy to concerned. He thought to himself that he was glad James didn't read his discovery at Lake Emma. What exactly did Christopher discover? Deep down in Grey City, Entity 01 felt it. He felt his powers, Emma, being destroyed. No. No. Furious, he knew what was going to happen. If events got changed in the very beginning, the entire future would be erased as they knew it. If James prevented the curse from ever getting out, all of history would change and Entity O1's plan of escape would be destroyed completely. If James prevented the curse from ever getting out, the curse would never grow, a second timeline would never be created, Bruno's soul would never be sent to Grey City, and the curse would never take over the world. As soon as James of the past removed the book from Wario's factory, all of the events that followed would be reset. Entity 01 had to make one final plan 
before all of this got wiped out and returned to the beginning. He had to make one final weapon. And Bruno was that weapon. He had seen how Bruno's deep desires were connected to his family. And he had seen how unusually strong Bruno's soul was. So he tempted Bruno one last time. Using most of his powers, he could be able to implant a memory in Bruno's mind so strong that it could remain even after the time reset. And so, he made a deal with Bruno. If Bruno could come and find the book after James removed it, go through with the biggest and most dangerous ritual in a book, only available to the strongest of souls, then he promised he would make his daughter healthy once more. And Bruno, he agreed. And shortly after, everything went black. The future, all of the events that we know about, got erased. And time had officially reset. <laughs> the plan of James and Christopher was a success. And we were back in 2004, one timeline, and the book was removed. So it doesn't matter if Wario found the book, because he made a deal that Bruno does the ritual. Recap before the showdown. There's been a lot of information up until this point. Timelines, time manipulation, curses, events, rules established, it's a lot to take in. So before we move into the final few chapters, let's back up a bit and do a quick recap. In 1988, Wario and Waluigi started Wario's Cafe and eventually built their own fast food factory. Here, Wario found an ancient book, used to worship Entity 01 in ancient times. He went through with a ritual and that curse basically corrupted his and his friend's souls. It was a curse that activated after Bruno Gates, a thief being offered a secret recipe, killed them. Their souls possessed their own dead bodies and killed Bruno Gate in revenge, and they were now seemingly forever cursed with revenge in their hearts. Christopher Peterson, a scientist working for a secret company, saw this threat and its potential, and used his own time machine experiment to send himself into the distant future and his wife, Rosalina, followed a plan they had made and sent the corrupted spirits of Wario and Co. back in time. This caused a tremendous amount of energy to be unleashed, and instead of just sending the souls back to 1988, the time and space of the normal world got split in two, ripped apart, meaning all souls and people were now existing partly in Timeline 1 and partly in Timeline 2. In this new timeline, half of the spirits of Wario and Co. were cursed and roaming around freely, while the other halves were in their respectful bodies. In this timeline, Wario's cafe closed down due to the cursed spirits haunting it. Wario went on to make WarioWare Incorporated, and he bought the building of a man named Lucas. The place felt haunted, and several years later, an ancient creature resurrected by Christopher Peterson's and Lucas McCroy's company burned it down. Wario's factory was then built, and the events from Timeline 1 repeated themselves, except for the ancient book ritual. After Bruno Gate killed them, their half-spirits went somewhere beyond, while the corrupted spirits from Timeline 1 took over their bodies. Bruno Gate's soul couldn't rest, and Wario and Co. stayed until the factory reopened later in 2014. Richard McRoy got a night shift job on the request of his father Lucas, and Wario and the others tried to kill him. The factory closed down. Richard had nightmares of Grey City and the Cursed Ones. WarioWare got reopened, and this time it was Thomas Taylor who got tormented by the Cursed Ones. Thomas experienced a time slip during his final night, something he didn't understand. He went to Wario's factory to investigate further, 
his experiences and got transported to Grey City, where he got trapped seemingly forever. Edward Coleman got a job at the old McCroy house. Max Peterson, Christopher's cousin, tried to help. On the final night, the curse had grown so strong, they were able to teleport Edward and themselves into the cellar of Wario's factory. But it wasn't strong enough to bring a soul down to Grey City yet. So they let themselves be sent back in time by Rosalina, creating a loop so they could keep growing. On the last cycle, they tricked Bruno Gate down in the cellar using a music box, similar to the one of his daughter owned. Here the curse was detached from the souls and Bruno was dragged down to Grey City and tormented and tortured until he was so defeated that Emma could send more of her powers into the real world through him. Emma had created separate entities of the curse known as the viruses and this curse and Emma as a whole kept growing stronger until the entire world was killed off many many years later. In a distant future the two timelines started to merge together, and in the year 2745, Christopher from Timeline 1 was alone in his lab, researching the curse and reality itself. He learned of Emma and some deep secret information that he claimed was too much for people to handle. He teleported James from Timeline 2 to him to assist him, and Emma took Christopher away to try to kill him. James made cryptic video games as messages that Emma hopefully wouldn't understand, but he was wrong. She came back and tried to end him too, but James defeated her and Christopher survived. The game messages were sent back to Timeline 1, where James of that timeline deciphered the message and changed history. Right before time resets due to those actions, Entity 01, the devil, made a deal with Bruno. If Bruno would unleash him into the world after the time reset, he would make his daughter healthy again. Bruno agreed, and a great time reset occurred. Since Timeline 2 was a direct result of Timeline 1, this meant that Timeline 2 was no more. Time got reset back to 2004, when Wario and Waluigi opened their fast food factory. Everything was back to the very beginning. Only two things were different. James had removed the book so Wario could not find it. And Bruno Gates still had the memory of the now non-existent future. The memory that Entity 01 planted in him. A new day in 2004. The sun was rising, Wario and Waluigi had recently opened the fast food factory, and they were already planning to hire Mario, Peach and Luigi. The ancient book outside the factory entrance was gone. James had removed it, but Bruno had been watching. Due to Entity O1's immense powers, he remembers the deal he made from the future that no longer exists. Bruno had snatched the book for himself. He kept it in a basement of his current home for months, unsure if he really should go through with all of this. After a long time, he had made his decision. His original plan was to steal Wario's secret hamburger recipe, but this plan was now changed. Before focusing on this ancient book, he wrote a letter and mailed it to Wario's factory, apologizing in advance for what he originally planned to do and what he now was about to do. He went to a dark alley early one morning when no one was around. He opened the book. He found the ritual Entity 01 had talked about. It was the very last ritual in the book. This was one that required a strong enough soul to perform, and doing so would mean selling it to the devil himself, to Entity 01. Bruno knew that this was the only chance of saving his daughter's life. 
He went through with the ritual, without much hesitation. Immediately after, he felt something was terribly wrong. What had Bruno Gate just done? What? What have I done? Nas is gonna come in. He's 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 summoned him into the world. As soon as you see him, yep, he's in there. <laughs> An explosion could be heard from the city center. People screaming and running, car horns going off like crazy, people panicking, and a loud, blasting roar was heard across the entire city. Entity 01 was loose in the world at last. People were falling like flies as his curse attached itself to people. One of these people were Daisy, as she was about to open her own shop for the day. It was chaos in the city. A huge building complex was utterly destroyed and instantly replaced with a building Bruno was very familiar with. A, factory? a theater from Grey City, or a replica of it. A similar theater. Entity 01 was planning to trap people in this hellish torture theater to punish them. One of the people captured was none other than Richard McRoy. He was confused and terrified. As he heard a live news on the radio, the reports were eerily similar to the nightmares Richard had in the now non-existent future. News about computer viruses, news about they're everywhere. Even the same news reporter was talking. Did Curse predict this endgame somehow in his nightmares? Richard was soon captured, and he had to go through similar trials as the one Bruno went through in Grey City. Newly created viruses were attacking the unfortunate victims trapped in these hell games. Some survived, others did not. Richard was one of those who managed to escape. He ran through the streets as he saw virus creatures killing people left and right around him. As he was running in full panic, his phone started to ring. He got into an abandoned shop, closed the door and answered a call. Hello? It was Christopher Peterson. Christopher Peterson. The two of them did not know each other, but Christopher obviously knew Richard's father, Lucas McRoy, and he told Richard that he worked for him. Back when the timeline was split in two earlier in our story, Lucas McRoy managed to live until 2014, when Richard began his job at Wario's fast food factory. Here, however, after the timeline's reset, Lucas McRoy passed very recently, only a few months after the factory was opened. Richard reached the McCroy house and entered through a hidden door in the kitchen, 
leading to the hidden living room that Lucas McCroy had been using as a study. A living room that only Lucas, Richard and his late mother knew about. Richard was never allowed in there as a child, but now he had no other choice but to dig up his father's deep secrets. He got a text message from Max Peterson, where he introduced himself as Christopher's cousin, and he assisted Richard in his task. As he was starting to look around for any documents, he heard the front door open up. The viruses had found him. Using the camera system that Secure Incorporated had put up, as well as hiding behind furniture and turning lights off, he managed to hide from the creatures until they eventually moved on. Richard continued to search, and eventually, he found documents from his father. One of the last documents he ever wrote. Let's see, let's see. Hmm. Here, we might have something. It is still my belief that there is something wrong with this world. I always found it strange that the land Wario brought for this factory was never claimed by anyone else beforehand. After researching, it's clear that there are some strange magnetic forces at hand where his factory is built. Magnetic and electrical forces, as well as unknown dark forces leaking through our radars. Something that seemed to be a polar opposite to the electrical forces. If our theory of an underworld and overworld is true, this might just be a gateway to these hypothetical destinations. I've never seen disturbances like this anywhere else before. But why here? Why was Wario allowed to build here? Yet everyone else have been denied it for decades and decades. I fear a dark age is ahead. If these dark anomalies are to be believed, its opposite force, electricity, might be our saviour in such a situation. I know not what we may be dealing with eventually, but something is coming. Oh, dear God, Father, I must tell this Christopher guy about this right away. Lucas McCroy had theories and insights into the land that Wario bought for his factory, that there was something strange with it, and something strange with the world as a whole. What other secrets did Lucas McCroy have? What other discoveries had he made? But now was not the time to get caught up in that web of secrets, Richard thought. If his father's hypothesis was to be believed, electricity was the key weapon to defeating these dark powers once and for all. Ironically, it's, it's electricity that works in Back to the Future too. Back to the Future. If the clock tower, Lucas McCroy has a secret. Oh, okay. What does Richard's father have? Entity 01 kept torturing people in his theater while he was looking for ways to reach this mythical overworld he was looking for, the paradise where he believed to have been created. He did not know that Wario's factory was a sort of strange magnetic point where these three worlds met. He did know before, thanks to Thomas Taylor reaching Grey City through Wario's factory, but those events are now erased. And thus, he was looking around for the entrance to the overworld and where it could possibly be. And if Richard and the others didn't hurry up, Entity 01 would soon learn of this truth. The truth that Wario's factory was the place. Richard and Max planned to bring powerful electrical components over to Wario's factory. No one knew Entity 01's desires and ultimate goal, but if Lucas McGroy's theories were right in that Wario's factory had strange forces in it, it certainly would be a location Entity 01 would be interested in. Richard began by going over to the old Wario's cafe, and found an electrical component in the basement cabinet. Before he left, 
Max asked him to bring a crowbar with him and take it to a nearby closed off building. This building he was sent to was the very same one that Wario turned into WarioWare Incorporated previously in our story. In this reset timeline however, WarioWare never existed. But the previous owners who had abandoned this facility was still a man named Lucas. And as you may have guessed by now, this previous owner of this facility was Lucas McRoy. He and a specific few other people from this secret company had used this facility for very secretive research in the 1980s. And they quickly abandoned the facility in 1986. Why exactly? Something happened there. This was even before the timeline split in two, meaning that whatever they did affected both timelines when that was still a thing. So what did it do? What made them leave so suddenly? As you may have picked up, there has always been something strange with this place. Bowser burning it down, Thomas Taylor experiencing a time slip. Have you ever wondered why these things happened? In 1986, Lucas McRoy and a few other scientists high up in the system discovered something while doing research and experiments in this building. They managed to open a rift in space. A rift to where exactly? Grey City? The heavenly overworld above creation? No, this rift led somewhere else. And they all felt this was not right. They all felt they were tempering with something they should have left alone. They tempered with the very structure of the nature of this world. And through this rift, something started to emerge. Something horrifying. In panic, they tried to close off this rift and succeeded. Partly, at least. They abandoned the facility shortly after. In the first timeline, and in this now currently reset timeline, the facility had remained empty ever since then. But in the now non-existent second timeline, where most of our story took place, Wario bought this facility and started WarioWare Incorporated in 1990. His claims that the building felt haunted, as you may remember, came from this very experiment that Lucas had initiated years prior. When Lucas and his scientists heard about this rumor that the place felt haunted even four years after their experiment, they feared their discovery was not gone after all. They did not know what this could imply, but they knew that this was not something to take lightly. They feared that whatever they had almost let into this world through the rifts they discovered may have just slipped in after all. At least somewhat. To try and cover their tracks and destroy this haunting discovery once and for all, they used their latest experiment, the resurrected Bowser creature, to burn down WarioWare Incorporated. The building burning down was indeed on Lucas McRoy's orders. They wanted to cover up and destroy this being they had encountered and potentially let into this world through this rift they created. But did this work? Did burning down WarioWare Incorporated really get rid of it? Many years later in this destroyed timeline in 2016, Thomas Taylor was working there after the grand reopening, as you may remember. But on the last night, he experienced a time slip. Jumping from October 2016 to May 2017 in the span of one night. The creature that Lucas McRoy had let into this world so many years ago was still not gone. Not fully, even after the fire. Yet it was not fully present either. But its powers, its presence, it caused a disturbance in the flow of time in the building. This entity, whatever it was, did not belong in this world. And thus it caused Thomas Taylor to jump forward in time. 
The question remains, what was this entity that Lucas encountered that he let through the rift they created? And where exactly did it end up after they tried to close the rift off? We're now back in the present, after the timelines reset back into one, after Entity 01 escaped into the real world in 2004. After acquiring a power component and a crowbar from the old Wario's cafe, Richard was on his way to this old facility to grab a powerful power generator that Max knew about. And they were planning to bring it all over to Wario's factory later, to defeat Entity 01 for good, should he appear there. Richard broke into the facility. Everything was quiet, as expected. Only a few things remained after his father and his team used this place almost 20 years ago. Among those was a power generator in the back room. Richard went back there and pulled it down with his crowbar. He picked it up and he dragged the big generator into the main office. As he did so, he felt a strange vibration. The room itself was not shaking, yet it felt like it was. Suddenly, a feeling of being pulled into a vortex. It lasted only a few seconds before all vibrations stopped, and Richard was back in the main office again. Only, things were different. Very different. The outside was pitch black. Not black as in a night sky, but even darker. Richard had never seen something so empty before. The office was red, twisted, almost like a distorted painting. What was happening? What's going on? Silence filled the surroundings. But someone or something was in there with Richard. He could feel it. Richard tried to escape, but it did not work. It was almost like the walls themselves represented the edge of the world, with a huge void beyond it. After being stuck there for a while, frustrated and scared, he saw the entity he had felt before. It was standing in a hallway next to the main office. It was Mario, only not exactly. He had multiple legs, a distorted face and a distorted body as a whole. Richard was just staring at it. This was it. This was the entity that Lucas McRoy had accidentally let into the world back in 1986. Oh, thanks. This entity was what they tried to cover up. This was the entity that took Christopher away when he was doing research in WarioWare Incorporated. Oh, okay. This is the entity that caused Thomas Taylor to experience an error in time. Oh. So where was this taking place? Where or what was this location? When Lucas and his team tried to close off this mysterious rift, to prevent this Mario-like entity to come through, they managed to trap him in an in-between place, Ooh, in between. a pocket dimension. A small alternate universe created by this breaking of the natural laws. This pocket dimension took the form of the very same facility it almost escaped into, only warped and twisted. Somehow, Richard got pulled into this pocket reality and came face to face with a being that resided there. This is exactly what happened to Christopher as well. When he disappeared from WarioWare Incorporated earlier in the story, he ended up in this strange place. But what was this being? This Mario creature? Where exactly did it come from? 
Richard experienced what could only be described as the end of a fever dream, as he suddenly found himself back in the main world once more. Confused and shocked, his phone immediately received a text message from Max. Max said he had lost Richard's phone signal, and that he should get out of there at once. Richard remembered the important task at hand, and immediately started his journey towards Wario's fast food factory. Richard reached the factory. He broke in and went into the control room where most electric circuits were wired up and where most of the factory's electronics were controlled from. Like washing machines or he wired up the powerful electronics which allowed antenna-like components on the factory's roof to emit overcharges. His work was now done. Finished. Now they just had to wait for the devil himself to show up. Before he could think another thought, he fell. The floor under him collapsed, and he fell through an incredibly deep hole in the ground. Screaming as he thought he would die any second, he finally landed in a deep pool of water. As he got out, he took a few moments to catch his breath before taking in his surroundings. He was in a cave, deep deep underground, far deeper down than the cellar tunnels of the factory. He pulled out a pocket flashlight he had on him and started to walk around. As he explored, he swore he could hear faint, distant laughs coming from deep within the cave. He quickly realized that these were carefully handcrafted tunnels made by man. Mario's down here. He walked further through the tunnels, getting more and more anxious and stressed as time went on. And in one tunnel in particular, he could feel a very strange smell and a strange vibe and feeling overall. I had to find a pick, I think. He instantly knew this was something dangerous. Radiation? A gas of some sort? He was not sure, but he quickly turned around and went back. In a big room he arrived at, he found a gas mask. An old gas mask on the floor. It had an old, rotten smell, but it would protect him. He could see carvings and drawings on the floor, walls and ceiling. One of these carvings and drawings represented the head of a horned beast. It was the head of Entity 01. He eventually found what seemed to be a staircase leading far, far up. It had to be an exit. As he started to walk, the faint laughter from before exploded in intensity right behind his head. And Richard ran as fast as he could. The laughs faded away as he got further up, and he reached the top only to find that it was only a pile of dirt above him that separated the caverns from the surface. As he dug through it, sunlight hit his face, and he felt safe once more. At least for a little while. He looked around him, and in the distance he could see the factory as well as the huge massive silhouette of Entity 01. Approaching the factory. Oh my God, look at this. What did he just stumble upon and fall into? He thought to himself. He had in fact stumbled upon a cave of an ancient witch coven who used to worship the ritual book and Entity 01. The mysterious coven was long gone, but her evil presence was still hanging around in the cave walls. As weird as this day had been, this was no time to think. He contacted Wario, the owner of the factory, and told him about the electrical components that were put in place. Wario was nervous. As this was happening at his factory, he felt some sort of responsibility to fix all of this. 
although he did not understand what exactly was happening. Wario reached the factory, and Tidio One had already arrived. If he found the entrance to the mythical overworld, who knows what catastrophe could happen? Wario immediately took hold of remotes and cables that were wired up outside and started to overcharge them. Entity 01 understood what Wario was trying to do and so he sent counterattacks, hoping to straight up kill him. But as the factory overcharged and sent electroshocks out, Entity 01 flinched and screamed as the entire sky seemingly lit up by the overcharges. Entity 01 took damage. And so Wario continued, now with a tiny bit of confidence built up, and Entity 01 continued with failed counterattacks. Eventually, dark energy started to leak out of the devil. Wario understood that this was no longer a power that was under the control of the beast, and so he was able to absorb it and use it against the beast. A sort of soul power, if you will, combined with electricity. Wario was winning. As the battle went on, Entity 01 grew more and more distorted, weaker and weaker, until the final scream could be heard across the entire city. Wario stood there, shaking and exhausted, and was still smiling from ear to ear as he saw the devil in front of him being vaporized for good. As Entity 01 was fading away from existence in a white purplish light, his final words came through. His dying voice told Wario that they had no idea what they had just done, and that they had no idea what they could have accomplished together, with his final words being, I was so close. He exploded, and with that, his theater, Emma, and all the viruses dissolved into nothing. The curse was truly defeated for good. A silence filled the air. Waluigi, Mario, and Luigi approached Wario, who had been watching from a distance. Hey, Jordans! There has to be more to this story. It's over. He's just gonna come back at a different time. The creatures are gone. The sound says return. Whatever all this was, somehow deep within, it feels familiar to me. Wario had finally learned. The greed, the reason for all of this starting in the first place, was no more. 
If the factory went bankrupt, then he just had to accept that. Yeah, don't read the he book. now understood that he couldn't fix anything with magic. He had to simply believe in what made his product unique and let everything else play out. And they all agreed. But Mario's thoughts were elsewhere. Oh no, Mario! Where was Peach? Surely she was hiding somewhere, right? Uh oh. Peach is possessing someone. Despite being the ultimate evil, Entity 01 kept his promise. Oh, he did. Eve, Bruno Gates' daughter, was healthy once more. Oh, he actually came through. Do you see Eve, the beautiful sunset? Bruno's ultimate goal was achieved at last. But where was Bruno himself? Yeah. Did he die with Entity 01 that he had sold his soul to? Or was he now free somewhere and was on his way to see his daughter again? That answer is for you to decide. It's oh for me to decide. Well, I'm gonna decide he's going back to see his daughter. Wherever he is. Everything was seemingly back to normal. The evil that had always resided Seeding below creation was destroyed normal. by the man who originally let it all loose. Oh man, this is bad. Peace was returned. The factory was struggling once again, but Wario kept his confidence up this time. One day, after a long day, oh, no. he was carrying boxes downstairs oh, into the cellar. And something strange caught his attention. At the end of the room, a, light. a bright yellow light was shining brightly. Oh, man. Wario looked at it with curiosity. There were no lamps or other light sources around to create it. Don't go in the basement, dude. He put the boxes down and went over to this light. Uh, and he tried to touch it. Oh, no. The stone floor beneath his feet disappeared. The smell of the old cellar was no more. And white light filled his entire vision before what could only be described as a hallucination or a fever dream or a huge revelation occurred. Wario woke up. All around him, he saw fields of grass. Wario had just found the realm above creation, the place Entity 01 was searching for. The overworld. The massive overcharges at the factory had opened a rift to this heavenly realm. And now, Wario was there. Only something was wrong. This was not a heavenly paradise. This was not a place of endless gardens and roses and golden statues. The grass was dark and gloomy. The sky was misty and grey. 
In the distance were tall, soulless buildings floating upside down. He began walking around throughout this strange landscape and found his surroundings to confuse and disturb him more and more. Light was distorted in several areas. Doors were standing in the middle of fields. Buildings were stacked on top of each other with nothing in them. Seemingly familiar faces faded in and out of his vision. What was this place? There were no people around. The place felt soulless and completely empty of life. He eventually reached a wooden hut that had letters written in ancient runes on the wall. Wario looked inside and, to his absolute shock, he saw himself. Multiple versions of himself, only they were lifeless, like a costume. Some finished, others half-made. He felt a deep sense of uneasiness. He felt like he stumbled across something that he was not meant to see. He quickly closed the door and kept going, only to find more huts around. One of them had a glowing light inside it, similar to the one he found in his factory. As he approached this light, Rapid visions filled his eyes. Visions of multiple Earths, multiple Warios, copies, parallels and the like. In the hut next to it was a strange metallic equipment that looked like a massive battery with a weird symbol on it that seemed to represent a circle with a strange lightning bolt going through it. Floating above this battery in the darkness were tons and tons of eyeballs, fading in and out of view, which all sent electricity down to the battery. Wario started to believe he was dreaming. He kept going through this surreal landscape, and he came across one final hut. The land behind the hut seemed to go on forever with no end. And so we thought this was the place to find answers, or perhaps even leave this place. The hut had a red glow coming from one of its windows. Red glow is never good. And on the wall outside was the same strange circle symbol that was present on the battery he saw earlier. As he approached the entrance, he saw more ancient runes carved into the wall. Oh, man. He did not understand them. Perhaps someone was inside. Anyone here? And so... All that he could do was to knock on a door. Yeah, I remember knocking on this. I wasn't allowed to go in. I remember knocking. <laughs> yep, that's what happens. Has his force to shut down. Final chapter. Okay, this you guys are saying I'm gonna like this? Revelations. I still think there can be more Oreo games from different dimensions. Six nights of Oreos is from a different dimension. Confused? If so, that's not really a surprise. What happened at the end exactly? Is the story over or is there something we have overlooked? Something we have missed. A key. At the very beginning, I talked about how it was strange how a dark, deep story had Mario characters thrown in. And that a reason for it did in fact exist. What did I mean by that? What happened to Wario in the end, and what does the weird circle symbol represent? Why is the devil named Entity 01? There are big questions left to be answered in order to unlock the final piece of the puzzle. In the game Five Shows at Wario's, Director's Cut, the final achievement is unlocked when Wario tries to enter the final cabin in the overworld. The description of the achievement? Locate Entity Zero. Who or what is Entity Zero? Let's take a step back. 
What is a constant in the Five Nights at Wario's games? What is an important element in all of them, in one form or another? Electricity. Lightning and the sound of power generators setting enemies off in Five Nights at Wario's 2. Creating electrical noises to push Wario away in Final Fantasy Wario 3's bedroom too. James using electrical components to defeat Emma in Final Fantasy Wario 4. Electroshocks pushing the enemies away in the five shows at Wario's. The list goes on. The biggest quality of electricity is, of course, being the weapon of choice against the curse. Is there a reason for this? Before facing off with Emma, James came across a note from Christopher, remember? When he said he made a discovery so huge that James probably wouldn't be able to handle it. Canonically, James chose not to read it. But in Final Fantasy Warriors 4, we can choose to see what would have happened if James had read on. We never get to know what exactly this truth was. What exactly was written in the letter. But the reaction from James gives us the impression that Christopher was right. James was not able to comprehend the information he read. to read Christopher's discovery. Look at it. Holy crap! different dimensions. I'm guessing there's different dimensions. Time, endless timelines. Where things can happen. That's what I'm guessing. Jillions, endless. That's what I'm thinking. Here comes the symbol. He drank too much coke. God, he had a stroke. <laughs> uh huh. While we seem to know all the events in the story by this point, we do not know all the details of what Christopher discovered. But the ultimate truth has been hinted at in Final Fantasy Warriors 4 all along. Entity 01's goal, his endgame, was to reach the overworld. And why is that? Because he believed that this was the place he was created, his origin. And why would he want to know that? 
because he did not know his purpose. Why does he exist as an all-powerful devil? There had to be a reason for him existing in this way. So if he got created in the overworld, that must imply there is a creator. Entity 01. The first entity ever made. Who's entity so who made the first one? Entity zero. The creator made the first one. Who made the creator? Entity 0 is the creator. You can call it the god of this universe, if you like. What exactly Entity Zero is? If it's a human, a god, man, woman, a creature, or something beyond our comprehension and imagination, is impossible to say. And we will never know the answer. It is not a representation of me, the creator of the story. It is indeed a character in the story. The main creator of this universe. The final hut warrior tries to enter in the overworld is where Entity Zero resides, and neither we nor Wario were allowed to see inside. We were not allowed to see what Entity Zero is, because our minds would not be able to understand it. Yet getting to this place was the devil's goal. The reason for his curse book existing in the first place. The reason for all of this madness happening. It was all a plot to try and reach back to what he imagined as a heavenly paradise, but as it turned out, it wasn't so heavenly after all. Instead, it was a strange, surreal, mysterious, otherworldly place. So if the devil had a goal of getting back to his creator, a goal of understanding who and what he is, did the creator himself have a goal? This is where the big secrets come in. Entity Zero's goal was, and still is, survival. It's never told to you directly because you not knowing is part of how it survives. How does Entity Zero survive? Electricity. What was the big battery in one of the huts in the overworld? The one that had the floating eyeballs above it? When you, the player, have this world open by playing the Five Nights at Wario's games, you use electricity. The eyeballs are you, the player giving life to Entity Zero by playing its story, its world, its universe, its creation. Why does this story have colorful Mario characters as protagonists? How else would the world attract players? How else would a story get noticed and kept alive if it wasn't for the cheap trick of using some of the most familiar faces in video game history? Entity Zero represents this game universe as a whole, and both run on electricity to stay alive. How did it get people, players, to have its world open and running? By creating a storyline, creating conflict writing out the script and rules of this universe, and setting it in motion. No story is without conflict. Conflict is the main source of an engaging story. It's what creates friction and a reason to keep following, in the hope that some form of change and evolution will occur. The first entity to be created in this universe was the representation of conflict and desire itself. Entity 01. The Devil. What is Entity 01's powers called in this electrical, digital world? Virus. His curse is literally a computer virus. The opposite force of electricity. It is the very cause of conflict, and thus part of the very source of Entity Zero's life in this world. The very reason the first Five Nights at Warriors game and all of the following ones have any gameplay at all. Is because of the curse creating conflict. After the devil was made, it obviously needed an opposite to counter it. Wario. Wario is the name and the face of this franchise, and so Wario is literally the main conductor of electricity. The main opposite force of the computer virus. What is Wario's main icon? And what most people associate with him visually? His mustache. 
formed as a lightning bolt. And what symbol is seen outside of Entity Zero's hut? A circle with a lightning bolt, Wario's mustache, going through it. This is the symbol of Entity Zero. And it's a visual message saying that this is a world, a planet, running on electricity. Wario's electricity. There's a reason electricity is what causes the fabric of this world to break open, leading to Grey City and the overworld, as well as the mysterious place this strange Mario apparition came from that Lucas McCroy discovered. The world is built with electricity. If it gets overcharged, the world itself breaks. Ever wondered why it's called Five Nights at Wario's, even though we're not always present in a Wario facility? Because this isn't just about Wario's companies. We are playing Five Nights at Wario's. Five Nights in Wario's world, Wario's universe. Five Nights in the story about Wario, the main attraction and thus the main conductor of electricity, which keeps the game's Entity Zero God alive. Wario was the only one allowed to build his factory on this specific piece of land, because that's one of the core settings for this world that Entity Zero made as he created the world. Wario had to be the one building his factory there, because this is where the three worlds meet, where the ancient witch coven would reside, and where core elements of the story would take place. Finance of Wario's 4 told us this in the sequence with James reading Christopher's letter. It told us that this is a world running on electricity. A digital world, where nothing is ultimately real. This is what Christopher discovered. That he believed no one would be able to comprehend. They were all part of a digital story. They are merely pieces of code, roaming around with seemingly free will. The huts with many unfinished Warios in the overworld, it's a storage. It was the first testing chamber, the prototypes for the story's upcoming main weapon and protagonist. If Entity Zero created Wario as its main electrical weapon and producer, what did the opposite force create? Entity 01 created Emma, or Demon Wario. The Anti-Wario. This is a story about the creator of electricity versus the creator of computer virus. Each having their sentient front figure. Wario and Emma. The demon Wario form exists to show that this is Wario's exact opposite. This is a story about greed and desire, about acceptance and letting go. The main antagonist's motivation is driven by desire. To know where it originated from, to know the truth, to receive the great revelation. In that way, you can start to ask the question, who is the real villain here? Is the devil, Entity 01, just one of the victims put onto a chessboard that he never wanted to be part of? Or did he really choose to be the way he did, to inflict all the pain and suffering? Is Entity Zero a villain? Or a hero? Good or evil? Can the characters in the story feel true pain if they are merely code? And what does that say about the god of this world? It puts together a concept, a villain and a hero, a man and a beast, gave the characters of the story free will and the ability to feel pain and emotion, set it all in motion in one big bang, and let go of the steering wheel, letting the story happen the way it wanted to. Did anything happen off script? Was Wario supposed to find the overworld? Was that part of the plan? Making the players excited and interested to know what happened to him next, resulting in me making this video which makes people go back to the games, all to keep itself alive? Or was Wario going off the planned tracks? It's impossible to say, because describing who or what Entity Zero is, is impossible. Sorry guys, I'm in Fine as a Wario's is a story, but also an entity I'm, in itself. The original one who created it all inside of the universe. 
What it is, is impossible to describe. It doesn't have a form anyone can explain. It runs on players giving it electricity by having its world open on their computers. And through giving the main antagonist a deep desire, conflicts occurs and a story is made. Keeping players at bay and keeping itself alive. If no one plays, if no one has any of the games open anymore, no electricity is given to this world, and Entity Zero dies. Which is why I cannot give out all the answers. Questions like what the ancient creature of Bowser actually was are questions you just have to dwell on yourself. The story, Entity Zero, so if he makes cannot games, reveal every secret. If the mystery is over, life. so is the story. So you may have two burning questions at this point. Yeah. What happened to Wario after knocking on the director's door? And what was the mysterious Mario entity that Lucas McRoy led into our world? Ooh, and where did it come from? Unfortunately, for now, these are questions you just have to give an answer to yourself. This marks the end of an era of Five Nights at Wario's. The evil of the story is defeated, but what truly was the real villain is up to you to decide. Yeah. A few questions remain unanswered, but that's how it's supposed to be. Knowing absolutely everything is never part of the fun. Will the story ever continue? At the moment, it's impossible to say. But a series of games Five Nights at Wario's has come to a close. And this marks the end of its main story. Thank you for watching, and thank you for playing. See, the end of its main story. See how he said that? He could go off on sub stories forever. Ever. Sweet. Wow. What do you guys think of that? In the end. Entity 01 is just another pawn in the game that keeps Entity 0 alive. The whole thing is to keep Entity 0, the entire franchise, is to keep Entity 0 alive. You think it's Entity 1 that's the bad part, but it isn't. He's just added, him and Emma are added for conflict for Wario and them, so us as players want to play. And beat them, which gives electricity to keep Entity Zero alive. Whoa. Thank you. This concludes. Yeah. There's definitely going to be more. This concludes the events of Five Nights at Wario's era in the storyline. There could be so many different storylines. Thank you for watching. <laughs> yeah, that is messed up. You think Entity 1 is the main villain, it isn't. He's just, again, another pawn to keep Entity 0, which we don't know, we'll never know who or what that is, keep him alive. We're all just pawns in his game to make electricity. Every time we play, we use electricity that keeps him alive. Whoa! Crazy! That is awesome! Wow. What'd you guys think of that? I thought it was pretty cool. That I never would have expected that. Like, he's just another piece on the chessboard for Entity Zero. Entity Zero is the main villain, for sure. Everyone else, including Entity One and Emma, are pawns even though none of them know it us as players war on all them entity one and emma they're all playing their parts not knowing that the puppet master entity zero is controlling it all that's pretty cool pretty cool <laughs>
Will we see more Wario games from WWW Wario? I'm not sure. I really hope so. I'm sure if he does make one, it'll be a cool idea. And But again, I remember he put five shelves of Wario out and thought it was a mistake. And it's like, no way, dude. No way. All right, guys, that's it. Hopefully you enjoyed it. I did. I, I This is amazing. I learned so much about the timeline and everything. Every time I play a game now, I'm going to be thinking, uh-oh, i got to use electricity uh, to, to, to send Wario back to here. Oh, I'm feeding. I'll be like, I'm feeding Entity Zero now. <laughs> I'm keeping you alive, Entity Zero. Ho hopefully you're happy. Every time I use electricity now in any Wario game, I'm going to be thinking I'm keeping Entity Zero alive. And if I happen to see Entity 1, I'm going to say, Oh, you and Emma, you poor you poor uh, misguided things, just like <laughs> war them all them. <laughs> That's crazy. Uh, all right, what questions do you have before I leave? Great stream, I love it. I'll be back to normal videos tomorrow. Uh the last couple of days, like I said, I, I want to do this. Well, I'll be back to a normal video tomorrow. What video that is? No idea. No idea. FNAF fan 69, what's your question? And then I got to go. What's your question? Like any time, or, or I suppose any time I see lightning, no matter what game it is, it could be a non <laughs> Wario game. If I'm using a shocker or something, it's like, uh, all right, Entity Zero, this is, this one's for you, big boy. <laughs> FNAF fan, go ahead. I'll give you a couple seconds to ask it. <laughs> have you played a FNAF game? Of course I have. I've played all kinds. All kinds. Just look up uh, Taste Gaming FNAF. I used to do Five Nights at Freddy 2 Custom Nights. I must have done 150 of those. I've done so many of them. <laughs> Sweet. All right, guys. I got to go. Uh, let me see. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, thanks for watching. I really do appreciate it. Um, I'll be back uh, soon with another, with just a normal video. And uh, usually I don't stream on this channel, but this was a special thing. But most of the other times I'm going to stream, I'll, I'll let you guys know. And then I'll be over on the Taste Streaming channel. Uh, you can, there's a link to that in every one of my videos' descriptions. Um, that's what I'll be doing most of the streaming is over there. But this is great. I learned so much about <laughs> that, that darn Entity Zero. Wow. No idea what video I'm going to do tomorrow. If you guys have any suggestions, uh, send it to me on Twitter or something. I'm not sure what I'm going to do tomorrow for a video. And then I'm working on some other things that uh, we'll see. Anyways, I love you guys. I still got a vlog too about all the new changes. I'm doing that next week sometime as well. But that's it. All right, guys. I love you. See you all later.